At an exposed clearing among the trees, we encountered a unit of three Jagd Panzers, low tank destroyers on a Panzer IV chassis, an excellent weapon, and we halted behind them while they scanned the open gap in the treetops for planes. The first Jagd Panzer moved away, surging along the exposed track and beyond it into deeper, thicker forest. The second vehicle paused, revved, and did likewise, dashing through the clearing. The final Jagd Panzer took a long time to check the sky, until our troops were calling out to it to move or get off of the path. Its commander ignored the cries, if he could even hear them, and finally gave the command to move. Just as the low, squat vehicle lurched off onto the clearing, the shapes of Sturmoviks tore over us, their shadows filling the roadway. The Jagdpanzer accelerated, committed now to making a break for the denser trees, and made it halfway. Then a volley of rockets smashed down through the trees, splitting the branches apart, and struck the jagged panzer directly on its flank. The machine reared up into the air, crashed down on its tracks and lost control. With smoke pouring from its grills, it veered sideways into the trees beside the road, knocking down several in its momentum and tipping over onto its side. The trees swayed and crashed to the ground, and this only exposed the stretch of road more brutally, giving the red pilots a clearer view of what was down there in the forest. Flames poured from the jagged panzer's engine as it came to a stop in a whirl of broken wood, its upper deck facing the break in the tree cover. The people clinging to my panther leaped off and began running into the deeper forest, as everybody could see what was about to happen. Civilians, troops, and medics all leaped and scrambled away from us, away from the target of the Sturmoviks. Only the civilian woman stayed, clinging to the turret rear, apparently too fearful to move, as I scanned the sky for returning aircraft. I saw none and could hear none, and told my driver to drive like a devil across the clearing. It was a risk, but it was riskier to stay where we were, with the tree cover broken and the jagged panzer on fire to mark the target. I dropped down into the turret, and my driver put us in motion with a force that flung me back against the rear wall. Through the periscopes, I saw the trees flashing past, and the burning panzer, with a crewman trying to drag himself out of the hatch, his whole torso on fire. Then the road in front of us lit up with exploding rockets, which ripped up the earth and trees, and sent a barrage of shrapnel over the panzer, the fragments hammering on the hull as we swept over the smoke of the explosion. The panzers behind us did not delay in making their move, and in a minute, both our panthers and the two king tigers were across and moving into the comparative safety of the thicker tree cover. After some distance we paused, and I went up through the cupola to assess the state of the hull. Around us, our troops and civilians were slowly reassembling, having run after us through the trees. On the engine deck of my panther, the civilian woman was lying on her back on the engine grills, her clothes blackened by oil fumes and shredded by the shrapnel from the rockets. Her eyes were open and she was still breathing, but the air was escaping from her chest wounds in long, hissing sounds. I lifted her and passed her down to civilians on the ground. The movement caused her a lot of pain, and she cried softly, with her eyes rolling back in her head. The capo came and stood next to me, his hands on his hips. We have to move on, he said, looking at the woman. The Jabos, fighter bombers, are everywhere. I promised to find this woman morphine, I said, and we have none left. She's dying. She helped us find the path. She was useful to us. The capo sighed and called for his own panther's medical kit. He took a morphine ampule and injected it into her arm. The woman moaned as it took effect and opened her eyes. Her hands fumbled, and she dragged from her pocket a photograph which she thrust at me. I took it, and the woman became still. I guessed that her death was ten or twenty minutes away. At least she was dreaming. I glanced at the photo she had given me. It showed a young woman of eighteen or twenty, the resemblance to the dying woman suggesting that it was her daughter. 
I frowned, and I put the picture in my tunic pocket, as more aircraft screamed in low above the trees, and the road that we had just passed over erupted in bursts of orange flame. I forgot about the photograph until much later. Further along the track, the primitive road was scarred with craters from recent bombing, and our progress was slowed as we had to maneuver past these craters among the other traffic. In many cases, the craters were being bridged crudely with planks and logs, the labor being done by the doomed men that we called Hiwis. The Hiwis were the Hilfs Williger, the Willing Helpers. These were Soviet troops who had surrendered to our forces in the good years of 1941 and 1942, when it seemed to everyone that the German steamroller would crush the USSR flat. At the time, these men were faced with prison camps that consisted of great squares of barbed wire, no huts, no tents, no shelter of any kind, no food except the weeds, and no water except the rain. How many had we killed in those encampments, while our guards looked in through the wire as the Reds killed each other and ate the corpses raw? Was it a million, or, as some rumors said, was it actually two million that we starved to death? The Hiwis had volunteered to help the German armies as a way out of that hell, working for us as laborers, drivers, and in other unarmed roles. Their reward was to keep living, to eat a ration every day and have a blanket at night. After Kursk in 1943, the Red soldiers became less prompt to surrender, and those that did were reluctant to work for us. They told us that the penalty for being captured was that their families would be sent to a gulag in the Arctic. Now the Hiwis in German territory were caught between two crushing forces. If they stopped helping us, they were of no further value and did not deserve a ration. Their punishment would be a bullet or a noose. Their only consolation was that the Russians did not know they were taken prisoner, and so their families were safe. But if they were captured by the Russians now, their identities would eventually be uncovered, and both the Hiwis and their families would face a death sentence. What can a man do in such a situation, faced with such a choice? Some Hiwis killed themselves by whatever means they could find while others continued to cooperate with our troops, hoping that in this way they could stave off their inevitable destiny. Their faces were set in masks of stress and fear, and their work was the work of condemned men, grim and methodical. We came upon a gang of Hiwis which was some ten in number, men wearing a ragged mix of Russian and German uniforms and civilian clothing. These men had evidently survived years of their role and were thin, with hollow eyes and shaved heads. They were hauling a 75 millimeter pack gun by hand out of a bomb crater as the gun crew simply stood and watched. The gun tractor was in a ditch beside the road, its engine pouring out smoke. As we passed by, other infantry ran past, shouting a warning that the Reds were close. The trees to our left were bulldozed down, and as they fell, we saw the green snout of a T-34 pushing through them, barely 50 meters away. I could see another red panzer behind it, and a squad of red infantry, too, clambering over the fallen tree trunks to get to us. There were screams from the civilians nearby, as, after so many years of being told about the red beasts, the beasts themselves suddenly appeared in the flesh. The Hiwis, meanwhile, ducked down into the bomb crater, leaving the PAK gun perched on the edge and the gun crew scrambling for their carbines. As the civilians stampeded away, I went down into the turret, ordered the panther to halt, turn to face the reds and fire as soon as the gunner was able. It became a race to take the first shot. In panzer duels, the opening shot is often the deciding one if it strikes home. Even if it does not destroy the enemy vehicle, it may damage the tracks or concuss the crew and buy precious seconds for a second shot. The task is to use a combination of the track differential to align the hull to the enemy tank and the turret traverse to lay the shot itself, controlled by the gunner's final hydraulics. An oddity of our Panthers was that only the gunner himself could traverse the turret. 
the commander had no traversing pedals of his own, and for those breathless seconds, while the gunner rotated the great turret left and right with his face against the padded rim of the gun sight, the gunner was the most important man in the machine. The panther turret traversed slowly, but to our advantage we were already stationary, while the T-34 was still laboring over the collapsed trees towards us. Our shot rang out, the tracer flew in its red line, and at that range, our 75 mimpied round punched directly through the T-34's turret, below the gun mantle. Through my periscope, I saw the red panzer recoil from the impact, and the machine crashed into an oak tree, uprooting it. The red infantry spread around the crippled panzer without faltering, and even when the T-34's turret exploded off the hull in a column of flame, then came hurtling down to crush several infantrymen as it hit the ground. Even then, they kept advancing on us. We fired from the bow machine gun, bringing down many of the reds, and at the same time my gunner was sighting on the second T-34, which was scrabbling over the wrecked trees in its eagerness to get at us. As its hole rose, we fired at its exposed belly plate, but our shot went wide as the panzer crashed down horizontally again, and we succeeded only in deflecting off the sloped front armor in a cloud of metal particles. My gunner cursed, and my loader worked like a devil to get the next round into the chamber. But as he closed the breech block, that second T-34 opened up on us. I had expected a tracer round, or high explosive intended to tear off our tracks. But what erupted from the T-34's turret was a long straight spurt of burning liquid, an absolute torrent of fire, which spurted through the trees towards us, the splashes catching one of the red infantry as he scrambled to get clear and setting the man on fire. The man's comrades made no attempt to help him as he burned, but scattered through the trees away from the fire, moving around to our flank. This T-34 was a flampanzer, flamethrower tank, fitted with a fire projector that resembled a normal gun, and its burst of flame caused so much smoke among the trees that it was impossible for a few seconds to see the vehicle itself. My gunner muttered to himself, his face pressed against the gun sight, making estimates of where the machine would exit the smoke and traversing a fraction to lay his shot there. I told the loader to have a high explosive round ready next, intending to blow away the flame tube on the enemy panzer. To our right, the red infantry was exchanging shots with the pack gunners and a squad of German troops who had come out from the forest but of the thousands who must be hiding nearby in the trees, only about fifty came forward ready to defend the Kessel. As I looked back through the periscope at the smoke, the Flampanzer crashed out of the flames and charged towards us, spurting a new line of incendiary liquid that flew wildly around the forest as the Panzer swayed between the trees. The fire shot past us, but I knew that if the liquid hit our rear deck, the flames would immediately pour through the engine grills and blow up our engine in an instant. We in the crew compartment would be reduced to ashes if we could not escape the hull in time. Already I could smell the stench of the Russian incendiary fuel and feel the intense heat from its flames, even through our armor plate. Our round was fired in a hurry and struck the edge of the T-34's turret glancing off into the trees without penetrating at that oblique angle. The Flampanzer lurched forward, traversing its turret to aim its fire directly at us and elevating its projector tube to make sure that its flames poured down onto us from above. The Red Commander did not get that chance. Our high explosive round exploded on the front of his turret and, as I had hoped, the detonation wrenched off the thin flame projector, sending it spinning off into the trees, trailing a ribbon of flames. Liquid began to gush out from the shattered gun mantle, cascading down onto the front hull. And as the T-34 began to reverse back into the trees to escape us, we landed another high explosive round in the same place. The effect was immediate. The shrapnel must have set off the panzer's liquid fuel reservoir for its flame gun because the turret hatch blew open and a vertical blast of fire shot up into the air. 
all of us in the Panther crew muttered thanks that this fate was theirs and not ours. What would it be like in the T-34's cramped hull as the entire supply of fuel exploded, sending that tower of flames 30 or 40 meters high? In seconds, the flames collapsed down onto the Panzer, and it was enveloped in its own fire, wedged between burning trees and sending spirals of debris out into the forest as it blew itself to pieces. The battle was not over yet. The Red Infantrymen, seeing their Panzers destroyed, began to retreat, but kept up a barrage of machine gun fire at our troops as they withdrew. I saw that, passing the bomb crater with the PAK gun perched on its lip, the Reds shouted and gestured in triumph as they discovered the gang of Hiwi men sheltering inside there, unarmed. Our troops began to hold their fire, perhaps conserving their precious ammunition, but also, I suspected, as I watched, waiting to see what the Russians would do with their fellow countrymen in the crater. I climbed out onto the rear deck to take a clear look around and saw no more enemy panzers approaching from any direction. The burning flam panzer was still erupting in orange flames. I saw that the Russians were surrounding the crater, putting grenades down the barrel of the Piak gun to disable it and firing their machine pistols down into the pit. I could just see the bodies of the Hiwis shuddering as they were torn up by the bullets fired by their compatriots. I shouted to one of our infantry on the ground, a young Feldweevil, to fire on the Reds and save the Hiwis, but it was too late. Their task completed, the Red infantry ran back into the trees towards their own lines, yelling and whooping in Russian. The whole forest fell quiet for a few moments, apart from the hiss and roar of the burning T-34 in the trees. I asked the infantry Feldweevil why his men had not done more to help the Hiwis in the crater. He shrugged. We have too many Hiwis in the Kessel already, he said. They're becoming a problem. If the Reds want to solve the problem for us, that's fine. As we skirted the crater and moved on, I glanced down into the pit. The Hiwis were jumbled in a heap at the bottom, their bodies still smoking from the bullet impacts. The damaged PAK gun was pushed in on top of them, and the scene was abandoned as the columns moved on to the west. In the Halby Kessel, the dead lay where they fell or were dragged to one side of the track and left among the trees. I saw some bodies being thrown into marshes and some being dropped into bomb craters. In my time inside the Kessel, I never saw a grave being dug or the earth being smoothed over a corpse. Our journey onward was slow in the gathering shadows of the late evening. In this warm, dusty air, the sights, sounds, and smells of the Kessel were stamped on my senses with a dreadful clarity. Inside the panther turret, the air was heated and rank with fuel and explosive, the transmission churning in the hull floor below the turret cage. We dumped our spent 75mm shell cases from the collection box below the gun, throwing them out of the loader's hatch in the turret rear, and left all the hatches open in an attempt to ventilate the compartment. The panther's lack of a loader's roof hatch made the attempt difficult. With my torso up through the commander's cupola, I could see the two SS King Tigers lumbering behind us, still carrying their load of exhausted SS troopers. On our panzer, every centimeter was taken up with wounded men who had pleaded for a ride, who lay bandaged and clenching their fists, even across the turret roof. Even our sloped front plate, with its pox and dents from enemy rounds that did not penetrate, was draped with men holding on by their feet to the front track covers. Explosions were all around us, rumbling in from the perimeter of the Kessel and random artillery shells exploded in the tree canopy sporadically. We had to bulldoze our way past a row of Luftwaffe trucks which were abandoned in the road, fuel siphons still hanging from their gasoline tanks. In the midst of this great crisis, these trucks were loaded with paintings and silverware that seemed to be taken from churches, the contents tipped out by those passing on foot and cast aside in their search for the necessities of fuel 
water, and ammunition. A large crater beside the track was full of corpses, troops, and civilians, adults and children, thrown in without order or ceremony. The smell of decay made my stomach bunch as we passed. In an area of marsh in a forest clearing, the green surface of the bog was dotted with vehicles that had been pushed in away from the road. Among them, a superb Jagdpanther tank hunter vehicle was sunk up to its roof, with birds already settling on its cupola. We glimpsed through the trees an area of open meadowland, in which an American Flying Fortress bomber was crash-landed, with its belly sunk into the ground and its tail thin as high as the trees. The meadow was being shelled, and although we were tempted to explore the plane wreck for possible fuel or supplies, we watched as the shell bursts straddled the great aircraft, and then hit it, blowing its fuselage to pieces in towers of flying metal. The shell bursts moved into the trees among us, and for a minute the forest was full of the screams of civilians between the detonating rounds. When the barrage moved away from us, it left a line of cars on fire, dead civilians scattered in the undergrowth, and then the columns of vehicles and walkers began moving on again. All around us, civilians and troops begged for a ride, for water, food, medicines, and directions, nobody knowing exactly where their friends or their units were. Some troops remained in units or groups with their officers, but many were now making their way west without leaders, combining together as the journey demanded. Money seemed to have no value in the Kessel. I witnessed a staff officer offering a wallet full of Reichsmarks to a Hanomag driver in return for a ride. The offer was rejected with a curse, but the driver took on a civilian couple who paid with a gold ring. The only viable currencies were gold, water, gasoline, food, and morphine. These were the things that the people of the Kessel held dear to their hearts. Order had broken down, and discipline, where it was enforced, was brutal and arbitrary. At one stage in this sector, we passed what appeared to be a panzer maintenance workshop set up beside a barn. I saw first the large steel gantry, which was used to lift turrets and engines from our panzers, a tall steel frame on wheels which rolled over the top of even the heaviest panzer. I was desperately relieved to see this maintenance site, as the final drive transmission in my panther was in its final stage of service. The huge power chain only lasted for 800 kilometers, and mine had passed 900 in the entry into the Kessel. The steel casing in the forward hull was leaking oil badly, and I could hear the mesh slipping in the gears as the driver sought to control it. If the system jammed in combat, it would surely finish us all. Did we have time to replace it? If a replacement was, by some miracle, available here? I saw a panther already parked under the gantry crane and three mechanics standing on its forward hull, looking down at the transmission cover. I knew the procedure well, the forward transmission on the panther, positioned in the front hull driving the front wheels, required the mechanics to remove a rectangular plate in the hull roof above the radio operator and driver's heads. This plate, part of the armor sheet, was unbolted and then lifted clear with the crane. The mechanics would swarm into the exposed hull, freeing the entire transmission from its mountings, and then lifting that out as well. The new final drive would be lowered in, the machinery so bulky that it had to be swung down through the space a millimeter at a time to ensure that it passed through. While this was going on, the engine deck at the rear would be opened and the armored grills taken out. The complete Maybach engine would be hoisted out by the crane and a new one installed in the armored box inside the engine bay. The whole process could be completed by skilled mechanics in a day, leaving the Panther ready to travel another 800 kilometers before the entire engine and transmission had to be replaced again. And so, when I saw the gantry crane in place over this Panther beside the barn and the three mechanics standing there on the hull, I expected this operation to be underway, but I saw no sign of the spare parts which were usually strewn around the service area, 
There was only the panther, with the crane overhead, and the men standing on the deck. Then I realized that the men were connected to the crane, with lines stretching from their necks to the steel girders. The men, in fact, had ropes around their necks, ropes strung up to the crane. I shielded my eyes to see what was happening there. The panther under the crane revved up, spewing out fumes, and then moved backward rapidly a few meters. The men on the front deck were left dangling, their feet jerking and their bodies convulsing as they were hung on the ropes. The panther commander turned to look at them, and then turned to face forwards, as the panzer revved again and moved away down onto the forest track. The panther bore the markings of the SS Panzer Corps. Time was pressing, and we could not stop to examine the scene. But as we passed, I did observe that the three men, swaying on their nooses as their bodies went limp, were in Wehrmacht Panzer Mechanics uniforms, the oil-stained overalls I had seen so many times. Around each man's neck was a placard, with writing which I glimpsed before we moved off. This man helped the Reds by refusing to help the Waffen-SS. When I glanced back, the gantry of the crane was full of ravens. The Kessel was not the place to make protests or complaints or to debate the question of martial law. It was the place to keep moving and keep your mouth shut and listen to the groans of your transmission, not the sounds of the wounded or dying. By shouting out requests for directions, we made our way through the gathering gloom into an area where panzers and other armored vehicles were dispersed among ancient oak trees. There were a trio of Hetzer tank destroyers, these useful little vehicles being worked on by their crews, and a unit of Panzer I-4 vehicles. The Panzer I-4s were in bad shape, their mesh armor screens buckled and torn, and their engine hatches emitting brown smoke. One was being towed by a captured T-34 chassis used as a tractor with no turret. That sturdy Russian panzer had traveled how many kilometers and changed hands how many times, and it served whoever drove it reliably, with no complaints. We edged past these vehicles, still with our load of wounded and trailing our column of followers on foot, until a solitary Kettenhund, military police officer, directed us forward to a clearing point where information would be available. By the time we finally pulled into this point, darkness was gathering and our engines were overheating badly again. The SS King Tigers moved away at walking pace, led by guides on foot who had cable phones connected to the drivers, seeking their SS Panzer Corps unit, which had its elements in the forest to the north. The capo and his gunner went to confer with the other panzer officers. We on my panzer opened the engine grills and checked over the Maybach as it gurgled and clattered in the twilight. All around us, people on foot were preparing to pass the night. People's behavior was becoming unpredictable, and it seemed that many wanted to drown out their fears. Among all the cries of the wounded, the sound of improvised drinking parties was clear on the breeze complete with mournful singing and the chinking of bottles. Some men and women were going into the shadows as couples, and the sounds of their copulation were clear to hear. The sound of people desperate to find some distraction, some suspension from the Kessel. One woman, a Luftwaffe flak worker, did not bother to find a discreet place, but accepted a Waffen SS man on the ground between the trees, her eyes blank as she stared up over his shoulder. We shook our heads at her audacity, but truly, who could blame her? Because who knew how long their life would last or their body would remain unscarred? A parachute flare ignited high above us, and its lunar light showed the whole scene in sharp relief. Behind the lucky SS man, others were waiting to take his place. The Reich had come to this condition now. How much further would it fall? It was around 11 p.m., and the sky was at times as bright as day, as the flares drifted over the trees or lines of tracer twisted overhead to strike the forest some distance away. The sound of combat along the perimeter of the Kessel was loud now, and it seemed that the Reds were drawing the noose tighter all the time. Groups of wounded soldiers came limping through our positions regularly, pleading for medical attention 
or knots of civilians pushing their wounded on handcarts, telling us in wild voices that the Russians were getting closer, always closer. One civilian woman shot herself with a pistol, and her dead body lay among the trees, near the brazen Luftwaffe girl and the eager SS men. The capo returned, and with him, the leaders of the other armored units drawn up in this part of the forest. They stood near our panther for a few minutes, talking in low voices, and then dispersed. The capo called us together, away from the milling foot soldiers, in the channel between our two panthers, with the great dish wheels on either side of us. Our drivers ran their hands instinctively along the track links as they listened, mentally assessing the tension of the track length. A green flare exploded above the treetops, casting a jagged light across us as it floated downward. The castle is small, but crowded, the capo said without emotion. There could be a hundred thousand troops inside here, and maybe twenty or thirty thousand civilians. The Reds have fresh troops stationed around us, with new armor, and they're pushing in all the time. In one day, or two days, the Kessel will surely fall. He looked between the panzers at a group of civilian women and children, asleep in the carcass of a truck that had become stuck between two trees. The children were asleep on top of the women, their faces lit by the swaying green flare light. With that coloring, their bodies already resembled corpses. Those in the pocket who can break out will break out now. At midnight, the capo declared. In 45 minutes, Herr Leutnant? I inquired. Our fuel? In 45 minutes, the capo nodded affirmatively. We will fight through a place called Halbe. That is the village immediately to the west. The Reds hold it, but we have a lot of panzers concentrated in a small zone. We will punch through Halbe into the flat land on the other side and cross the north-south Autobahn at Baruth, or near there. After that, it is forty or fifty kilometers to the positions of the Twelfth Army, who are ready to receive us. We will pass through the Twelfth Army corridor and reach the River Elbe. We know that the Elbe is held by Americans on the West Bank. We will be taken prisoner in the, uh, in the American zone. We know why this must be done. Germany needs us after the war ends, and if we are captured by the Russians, we will not see Germany again. The green flare overhead caught in the treetops and set light to the foliage. Simultaneously, there was a shriek of descending shells, and we threw ourselves flat between the panthers, trusting to their steel to fend off the explosions. Looking up, I witnessed the truck full of women and children fly into pieces, with bodies whirling through the air in the flashing light. I pressed my face into the ground and dug my fingers into the earth as the panthers rocked in the bombardment, and the stink of explosive and smoke enveloped us, the screams and cries of the wounded echoing over the detonations. When the barrage ceased and the artillery rounds stopped falling, I stood up, unwilling to face the sight of the blown-apart truck. The capo was already on his feet, staring at the wreckage. The civilians were dismembered, lying in dark pools in the green light of another flare. Nearby, the Luftwaffe woman and her SS lovers were also dead, their bodies jumbled together in a smoldering pile, her eyes still blank and open. We started the Panzer engines. The way to the breakout point was marked by Kettenhund, military police, men and panzer officers, holding masked flashlights and keeping all pedestrian traffic off the forest tracks, by force if necessary. We saw one Kettenhund kick an encroaching infantryman out of our way, and then shoot him with his MP40 when the man fought his way back onto the road. Whole carts and wagons were tipped over to clear the roadways, their civilian owners watching us mutely in the light of the overhead flares and the flashes of explosions from the perimeters. We passed under an oak tree burning like a brazier, surrounded by the bodies of wounded troops who had been sheltering under it when a shell struck. Our way was lit again by the flames of a burning aircraft which scraped the treetops and then crashed to our right in a ball of flames that resembled the morning sun. We followed two of the Hetzer destroyers, 
and when one of them was hit by a falling tree and immobilized, we bulldozed it out of the way with our front plate and simply carried on. Behind us was a jumble of armored elements, all racing for the breakout point, and behind that we knew that there was a dense column of foot soldiers and civilians, people in wagons, cars, and trucks, all desperate to follow the armored spearhead through Halbay and out to the west. The plan for the breakout was crude. It had to be, because the Reds were crushing the pocket around us, minute by minute, meter by meter. The first blows would be struck by the King Tigers of the SS Panzer Corps, supported by the remaining armor, artillery, and Panzer Grenadiers from the 21st Panzer. The SS boys are desperate to be the first ones out of the Kessel, the capo had said to us with a wry smile. They know there's no prison for them, not even in Siberia. Any SS who falls into red hands is shot or clubbed to death. We can rely on them to lead the way. I could see the flashes of our artillery firing through the trees on either side of the road. The gunners were under orders to fire off all their rounds, then smash their gun breech blocks and race for the breakthrough point on foot. The fuel tanks of their trucks had been drained to provide gasoline for the panzers. Ahead of us was the Capo's Panther, his exhausts trailing flames, and beyond him, the stretch of open country that led to Halbay itself. I could see that fighting was already erupting out there, beyond the screen of the forest. Bursts of flame, drifting flares, and the starburst explosions of rockets lit up the open heath in spasms of light. I slid down into the cupola, sealed the hatch, and held on as we lurched out of the final forest track, out into the heath. Through the periscopes, I saw the church tower of Halbay Town, illuminated against a curtain of flames. Whatever was happening in that small town, the place resembled a medieval inferno, full of sparks and fires. Our panther rolled across the heathland, smashing apart stationary cars and trucks that were strewn in the open. The flares overhead gave a light that varied from dusk to bright sunshine, making my eyes constantly adapt and readapt to the intensity. In one such flash, I saw the Capo's Panther run over a motorcycle and sidecar and send the whole machine flying through the air behind its tracks. The motorcycle span towards us, blocking my vision as it crashed onto our turret before disappearing. We slammed down into a sudden defile, and I cursed out a prayer that this was not an anti-tank ditch. As we clawed up the other side, I saw a tracer flash past us, and then we were hit twice on the glacis plate as we leveled out. There were red pack guns down there around the village, and the decision for us was whether to halt and fire on them, or to keep moving and present a rapid target. The capo had no doubts. I saw his panther sway and lurch as he approached the town in a ragged zigzag, with tracer flying past him at each turn. With a few hundred meters to go, we had to slow down to pick our way between craters and ditches which would trap us for sure. In this zone, we came to a king tiger that was immobile in a crater, its nose slumped down and evidently stuck fast. Its huge gun barrel was elevated so that it could fire on the packs, and it was maintaining a storm of fire on those positions. As we went past this stranded panzer, I saw it struck on the side of the turret by a tracer round, and then by another. The whole 70-ton machine lurched, its hatches flying open and emitting towers of flames, until one final explosion from inside lifted the entire turret off the hull and sent a sphere of red flames boiling up above us. Lit by this fire, we presented an easy target, but within a few seconds, we were literally on top of the surviving Russian PK guns, too close for them to fire over open sights. The packs were dug in along a series of emplacements before the town, and the advance wave of King Tigers had already mauled them badly. In the chaotic light of the flares, I saw that several guns had been run over and crushed by panzers, their barrels and wheels reduced to a jumble of steel, and their crews dismembered around them. One pack was still intact and surrounded by living men, and we halted with a great screech of metal to let our gunner lay his sight on it. 
at a range of 50 meters, we used one high explosive round to demolish the emplacement. Some of the red gunners, outlined against the flames from the town behind them, raised their hands in surrender. My gunner shot them down with his coaxial MG, and we rolled forward into the outskirts of the town itself. The open heath gave way to a series of farm buildings, and then the first outlying houses of Halbe, at some distance from the town itself. The Capo's panther was already moving between the farm units, and ahead of him I could make out one of the King Tigers, which had spearheaded the breakout, its profile stark against the flames. All around, shells were detonating, knocking huge pieces out of the farmsteads and rocking us with their blast. In the swirling light, we almost collided with a Panzer IV, which was immobile beside a barn. Peering through the periscopes, it was difficult to make out what was happening around us, with so much smoke and dust. I put my head up out of the cupola to try to see the way ahead. The roar of explosions and flames surged over me. The Panzer IV in front of us had shed its tracks, which were looped around it in ragged pieces. The Panzer crew were clambering out on the hull, gesturing to me to accept them on board. As I shouted to them to climb on, though, figures emerged from trenches around us. Figures of men in Red Army padded jackets, and they began to swarm over the Panzer Eiffel. In moments, the Panzer crew were shot down. One man who jumped clear being stabbed through the neck with a bayonet by one of these Ivan Panzer hunters. My hull gunner and main gunner both fired their MGs and shot the men on the Panzer to pieces, both the Soviets and the dead bodies of the Panzer crew. The adversaries lay jumbled on top of each other in the light of the flames, their blood mingling on the armor plate. As soon as this danger was overcome, Red Panzers burst in among us. These were not the ordinary T-34s. I saw immediately, as one of these monsters appeared through the smoke and began to traverse its squat, oblong turret onto us. These were Joseph Stalin types, the equal of a King Tiger, with a slow but fatal main gun more powerful even than an 88 mm I gave the bearing of one of them to my gunner. J.S., my gunner muttered in my headphones, and I felt the turret twitch, as he traversed our 75 millimeter onto the Russian. I dropped back inside of the turret, where peering out through the periscopes, I could barely see the Stalin, about 100 meters distant, shrouded in the smoke. That massive red panzer would normally stand back and pick its enemies off at distances of two kilometers or more, but in the dark and smoke, it needed to come to close quarters to be able to see its prey. Its colossal main gun was gradually turning on to us, but our traverse was quicker, and our driver aided it by using the track differential to swivel our hull so that our gun came into alignment more rapidly. While the Ivan turret was still turning, we fired. The round deflected off its armor and disappeared into the smoke. Beside me, my 75 mm loader worked like a grim dervish on the breach while the gun fumes filled the turret. We fired again. I blinked, wiped my eyes, and stared at the JS. That round, I said. Is it? Yes, the gunner muttered, squinting through his gun sight. It's stuck in the armor. Our 75 mm projectile was sticking out of the JS turret armor, still smoking, like the horn on a devil. Reverse! We slammed backward, crashing through the wall of a barn as the JS fired on us. Its round flashed in front of us and flew off across the open heath towards the spree forest. We were at point-blank range with this Stalin panzer, blinded by smoke, in a zone that we had no knowledge of. The only thing we knew for certain was that we had to get through the town of Halbe, and this Stalin was barring our path. The Kapos panther was nowhere to be seen, and where were our king tigers? How would we break past these huge Ivan machines into the town and out to the west? Every thought, every breath was punctuated by the detonation of mortar rounds exploding between us and the Stalins. If we could not break past them, 
the Kessel exit would be sealed again, and its hundred thousand inhabitants would meet a savage destiny. The Russian JS Panzer was notoriously slow to reload its huge gun, having, we believed, a two-part shell system in which the projectile and propellant were loaded separately, as on a battleship. In the time it took, my loader replenished our breach again, and I ordered my gunner to fire on the Stalin, which had shot at us, but to hit him in the running gear, not the hull or turret. It was a difficult shot in the drifting smoke, with only the front of the Stalin's track visible as a target. We fired once, and the round deflected off the edge of the glasses by the track. We were reloaded and primed in seconds, and our second shot blew the right front track clean off the Stalin's drive wheel, making the machine rock on its axis. Before its crew could react, I ordered our driver to charge the Stalin and to veer around so that we were at its rear, where the armor plate was thinner over the engine. With mortar rounds bursting around us, we crashed out of the barn and over to the Stalin's right, then slowed and rotated around so that our gun was pointing at the Red Panzer's back plate. I saw the Stalin try to heave itself around on one track, but this was slow and our gunner was faster on his final traverse. Our precious armor-piercing shell smashed into the Stalin's thin back armor. The light from the overhead flares was so clear that I could see our round pierce the metal in a spray of dislodged fragments. The round deflected off something inside there and came shooting up vertically out of the engine grills, followed by a plume of sparks. The grills flew apart, and a flash of flame lit up the whole Stalin, turning to oily smoke which coiled in tentacles around the vehicle as it shuddered and tried to move. We began to reverse from it, conserving our ammunition, but that Stalin crew was not done with us. As we turned to drive past the wrecked machine, I saw its hatches open and men climb out, calmly and orderly. Five men, some armed with machine pistols. Our hull gunner fired and knocked two of them down, but the armed men dodged towards us, getting so close to our flank that I lost sight of them beside the panther. We began to accelerate away, but immediately crashed through the smoke into an earth mound, which blocked our backward progress. Our cursing reached a crescendo of obscenity as our dish wheels slid while we tried to reverse over the mound. Our hull, up in the air, and our tracks throwing out earth as our weight took us back down. As we landed with a crash, I heard the screech of our engine cut out and die. Our panther had stalled, and we were stationary. None of us needed to curse our driver. He knew exactly what to do. He worked the starter lever, trying to engage the start motor, making the system whine but not catch, each sound tearing at our hearts. I saw our loader's eyes fill with tears, and I had no words to console him. Were we now to be stranded here and forced to join the helpless swarms of people on foot rushing through the maelstrom of Halby? Please, our gunner said. Come on, please. It won't catch, our driver muttered. It won't. I heard noises on the rear deck of the panther. Were they German troops climbing aboard in the middle of the battlefield? I peered through the rear periscope and caught sight of a Russian tank crewman in his ribbed helmet, smashing at our engine grills with the butt of his machine pistol. The Verdam Reds wanted vengeance on us for destroying their fine Stalin panzer. I fired my pistol through the small port in the turret rear, intended for this purpose, but the angle was wrong, and without engine power, we could only turn the turret slowly with the hand crank. If the Reds put one bullet into our fuel pipes or one grenade under the grills, our Panther would never start again. I slid open my cupola hatch, took my MP40 from the turret wall, and pointed the gun out over the top. I realized it was no use shooting like that. My bullets would surely go through our own grills. With no choice, I heaved myself out and came face to face with a red tank crewman who was trying to prime a flare pistol, pointing it down at the engine covers. I shot him, and he tumbled off the deck, but his comrade was on top of me. Unarmed, the man smashed me in the face with his fist, and I tasted thick blood in my mouth. 
I shot at him wildly and saw him jump from the panther onto the earth. Down there, a gang of our troops leapt forward. Not only troops, but women too, armed with rifles and pistols. They set upon this man and cut him to pieces with shots and blows, until one woman, armed with a civilian shotgun, administered the final blast to his face. At the same time, our engine rumbled and caught, and the panther came to life again under me. Comrade, take us with you, the ground troops shouted over the din. I could not deny the ground soldiers and civilians the chance to ride with us. The approach to Halby would be murderous on the back of a panzer, but if they wished to take the danger, so be it, and their close quarters protection against marauding Russian infantry would be welcome. With this clutch of half a dozen armed fighters on our rear deck, I climbed back into the turret. We rounded the earth embankment and moved off towards Hal Bay itself in search of our other panzers and the route to the west. Coming through the outlying farm buildings with me peering through the periscopes from inside the turret, I saw quickly how our SS King Tigers were engaged. The lights of flames and the parachute flares were still bright. And in that flickering glow I saw that our heavy panzers were fighting another row of Stalins. These red panzers were dug into the ground on the edge of the village itself, with only their turrets above the earth. I could see three of them, with their block-shaped turrets black against the flames behind them. Our King Tigers were shooting them up from a range of less than one kilometer, blowing up clouds of soil as their high-explosive shells exploded around the emplaced Stalins. One tiger was evidently firing armor-piercing, and I saw the tracer shells corkscrew off from the side of a Stalin's turret in the drifting smoke. On the other side of the tigers, I thought I could make out the Capo's panther, behind a ridge, firing intermittently at the Stalins. Behind those few red panzers, the town of Halbe stood in flames, with artillery rounds exploding over it in starbursts that sent roof tiles and chimneys whirling for hundreds of meters. I guess that bombardment was the last of our artillery, using its ammunition to break up the Soviet positions in the town. The Russian artillery, though, was now laying down a thick screen of explosions in front of the town daring us to run the gauntlet of shrapnel, even if we could defeat the Stalins. I did not anticipate that our Panthers would be of great use in this initial fight against the Stalins. That would take the King Tigers. Besides, I didn't need to count our ammunition. I knew it well enough. Barely twenty rounds of armor-piercing remaining, and ten rounds of high explosive. That would need to last until we were through the town, over the land to the west and inside the 12th Army Corridor. I kept my panther concealed in the rubble of a collapsed farmhouse where the rafters and slates covered our profile, and, with our riders still cowering on our rear deck, I considered how to approach the town. I could see four King Tigers in all, firing on the three Stalins, their higher rate of fire undermined as an advantage by the ultra-low position of the red panzers in the ground. The Tigers were having no success, and they were taking hits on their front plates from those massive battleship guns in the Stalin machines. One such hit struck a King Tiger on the gun mantle, and I saw in an instant that the tracer shell deflected down and hit the deck hatches under the barrel. A hatch flew off into the air, and then a jet of sparks erupted from the deck. I shuddered to think of that Soviet warhead screaming around the inside of our panzer, ricocheting off the interior walls and carving a path through any human body that it touched. I had looked inside the hulks of many destroyed panzers, ours and the Russians, and I knew what the process did to flesh and bone. The King Tiger's turret hatches blew open, and in a moment its ammunition exploded, sending a helix of flame up from the open vents. Even as the Panzer was enveloped in its burning gasoline, the other King Tigers took their revenge, focusing all their fire for a furious ten seconds on one of the embedded Stalins. My gunner chuckled to himself. With his telescopic sight, he had a better view than me but even I could see the Stalin hit repeatedly by three, then four shells, 
until a great scab of metal broke away from the turret and spun off across the ground. The broken shell of the turret exploded, throwing the crew members up into the air amid sparks and flames. They had scarcely fallen to earth before the King Tigers turned their fire to the second Stalin, which was hit immediately in the gun barrel where it joined the turret. That Stalin's barrel slumped, and the huge machine began to reverse back out of its low emplacement. The overhead flares turned to orange and green, and in this lurid illumination we saw the Stalin reverse a few meters, exposing its upper hull to our tigers as it went back up the gradient. One 80B8 medium around punctured the forward hull, and another ripped open the engine deck as it rose into the air. The Stalin slumped back down into its trench, with crewmen beginning to drag themselves out of the hatches, their clothing and helmets on fire. I thought the Tigers had finished with them, but one of the Waffen SS gunners insisted on firing a high explosive round, which exploded centrally on the Stalin. My gunner chuckled again. The red crewmen climbing out of the hatches were severed in half by the explosion, their torsos blasted completely away, leaving only the stumps of their bodies jammed in the hatch openings. Its escape routes blocked, and its hull shot to pieces. The Stalin began to burn. The third Stalin panzer was outnumbered now by three to one, but still it kept firing on the King Tigers. I had to admire its commander when, with 80D Mimitermi round smashing off its turret, the panzer reared up and burst out of its dug-in emplacement onto the open ground itself. There was to be no retreat for this hero of the Soviet Union, even if nobody ever knew his name or his actions. He was going down defiantly, taking his machine and his crew with him. That was achieved in a few seconds as the Stalin began to race towards the three King Tigers, clearly intent on ramming one of them. The Tiger shot his tracks off with high explosive, and, as the Stalin careened sideways across the heath, they stood silently and watched as the Red Panzer crashed into a crater, flipped over slowly, and came to rest upside down, its turret in the earth now and its wheels in the sky. Flames licked around it slowly, but the King Tigers were already moving towards it, then past it, and then their lumbering profiles moved into the outskirts of the town itself. My panther followed, tucking in behind the capo's panther as he too emerged from his concealment and joined the column. Behind us, I saw through the periscopes in the glow of the flares and burning vehicles that hundreds of people were already following us closely, troops, Wehrmacht, SS and civilians, in cars, trucks on foot, and on Hanamags, as our breakout column slowly pushed ahead into the chaos of Halbe Town.